please welcome Jessica Bartholomew. Isn't it weird? Because you've been hearing from me all morning, so. <laughs> now you know who I am. So I think I'm transitioning to this mic pack um, because I don't know how to be still. So I hope I don't make you dizzy, but I go back and forth a little bit. So I really love, I always wrap us up. I always really intentionally try to take the last session of all our conferences and training programs because we don't like to just dump information. We don't like to just make you aware of what's going on, but we want to we want to connect that. What connect that to a next step. Connect that to a small step that's going to make a big impact. Connect you to resources. And what we're going to talk about today is youth prevention education. And we have tools available. One of the things that I hear, we get a, we field a lot of questions from different people and in the schools and churches and stuff. And they say, what can we do? And what can we do to end this problem? And we have a curriculum for this. So I get excited when I get to say, hey, there's tools right here in our community that we can use. Um, so it's an exciting session. For me and what i hope to do is i'm going to i'm going to present the six keys and then i'm going to give you a little bit of education on what the students uh, receive so that you see the kind of information that they get and then we are going to wrap up with actually talking about and showing you our youth aware prevention curriculum and some youth stories on um, the success stories that we have and how youth are getting involved and becoming the voice for this day in history to end human trafficking, to protect each other and themselves. So here's what we noticed, right? What we noticed is that the largest going cr growing crimes in the world are crimes of sexual exploitation. And those crimes are targeting youth people under the age of 18. These crimes are targeting our vulnerable or at-risk populations or students or young people. So we have the fastest growing crime in the world. It's targeting our young people. We started noticing the effects of these crimes, the mental health effects. We may be in the school setting. We may be in uh, the medical field, the mental health field. We may be parents. We may be uh, pastors, youth pastors. And we see these manifesting things, the mental health issues with depression, isolation, uh, PTSD, anxiety. Uh, really getting withdrawn. We have uh, social isolation. You might see bullying in school. One of the one of the signs um, that happens quite often when a child has been exploited through sextortion or sexting is bullying at school. Well, why is that? Because the photo, the nude photo, or the sexy, <clears throat> excuse me, photo that they sent to their peer at school privately, right, suddenly was shown to the whole football team. So now he, she shows up to school, walking down the hallway, is getting called names, is getting isolated, is getting bantered. Um, academic performance we see dropping. And when we realize and we uh, ask some questions and go a little deeper, crimes of sexual exploitation are at the bottom of some of these behaviors that we are dealing with on the surface. So we have the fastest growing crimes in the world targeting young people. The effects are physical, mental health, academic, social isolation, bullying in school. You'd think they'd come forward with all of these problems, with all of these behaviors, with all these things happening. And what we're finding, it is, and we've learned this morning, is that these are absolutely kept in secret. There's a lot of secrecy with this. And so we have these devastating things happening to our young people who aren't saying a word about it. That's a problem, huh? If we don't know, we can't do anything about it. And the reason that they're keeping it quiet is fear. Fear of, will I get in trouble? For, uh, did I participate in this? Did I sign up for this? Did I do anything wrong in this, whether it's trafficking or sextortion? Fear of the violence and the retaliation of the person that exploited them? Shame. You know, these are sex crimes. And 
Perpetrators, predators are really good at passing the buck and passing the blame and phrasing their language and phrasing their communication to the young person as putting it off on them and as their behavior issue and not the adults. So there's some shame involved with some of these uh, crimes. Um, sometimes there's secrecy because this is a family member. Uh, like we've been learning about this morning, too. This is the person that is providing me shelter. This is the person that feeds me. Uh, this may be the only person that I've gotten affection from. And so there's secrecy for all these reasons. So when we take a look at this, we were like, well, what is the answer? And the answer, the, uh, for those of us that are in the field, the way you're going to end something like I brought up earlier is by going upstream to get ahead of it in prevention education. When we know, as a police officer and doing investigations and being undercover and interviewing the buyers, interviewing the traffickers, interviewing the drug dealers that work with the traffickers to give the young people the drugs so they can be trafficked, and interviewing those survivors um, that come forward or are found, I have a wealth of information here. I have hindsight on how our young people got here. And so it becomes my goal and my mission to get way the heck back here, knowing what made these youth vulnerable, what was presented to them. I'm going to get free LASIK surgery if I <laughs> keep stepping in front of that thing. <laughs> I do need an upgrade, so <laughs> it's been 10 years, 12 years. So if we know what made them vulnerable, we know the tactics that were used, we know how the buyers are thinking, we know what got to this place here. My goal and mission is to come all the way back here in prevention education to get ahead of it. Because if I saw the gaps and the vulnerabilities that led them there, I'm going to come back here and I'm going to fill those gaps. I'm going to remove those vulnerabilities. I'm going to do what I need to do here so I can start ripping targets off of young people's backs or those that are at risk in our community, right? Because when we get over here, and hey, if, you, if you're not a heart-driven person and it's not about the people to you and it's about numbers and where do we invest ourselves, well, the, the Women's Foundation of Minnesota, they funded a study about, was it five years ago now, um, to take a look at prevention. What has the greatest impact for the dollar? Because we do studies, we present numbers so that we can get funding, government funding, right? So what did they find? They found that $1 spent in prevention over here compared to $34 in aftercare restorative services, the shelter, the medical, the mental health needs, the drug addiction uh, recovery programs. So financially, which isn't my thing, but financially, 1 to 34. Prevention makes a difference. What we're finding when we do prevention education is youth are getting the education and the awareness that they need. They're the targets. So all the parents and all of us can sit in the room and we can talk about this all day long, right? But it's that youth that's going to be on the internet at 2 o'clock in the afternoon having a conversation with somebody that they just met online that's going to become their new romantic online relationship that pretty soon is going to be asking for that nude photo or that explicit photo and saying, here's mine, send me one for you. They're the ones that are targeted. They're the ones that need the information and the awareness and the education. When we educate kids, they can self-protect better. They become advocates for themselves, but also we see them becoming advocates for their peers and even for their siblings. We've had youth that have intervened on trafficking situations with siblings as a result of being in prevention education uh, programs. We also know from research, from life skills research um, and psychological research, that resilient kids have certain things in place in their life. They are connected. They feel valued. They feel like their life is worthwhile. They are connected. They feel like they're a part of something bigger than themselves. 
We, removing the marginalization and the, isol and the isolation sometimes that youth or teens can feel. So by doing prevention education, we're giving them the awareness that they need to self-protect and protect others. They're becoming advocates for their generation and in their schools and in their churches. They become more resilient if harm happens because they are connected individuals now. And we see so many effects uh, reversing those effects that we see uh, earlier on. So prevention education works. Where does this come from? This comes from, now it was read in my bio, but when I give you these six keys, this is where it comes from. It comes from 25 years of experience working in at-risk populations with youth. By doing intervention work, 12 years of law enforcement, six years undercover in narcotics that had the, the overlap of human trafficking, which then led me into the pornography and the human trafficking work, and um, the massage businesses and everything else. This comes from studies and research. Um, the Minnesota Human Trafficking Task Force, when, we did, when, when they put forth some money and they interviewed youth, youth that had already been affected by sex trafficking and youth that hadn't. What did youth say in research? They said, I need to know what the law is and I need to know what a healthy relationship is. If I would have known what a healthy relationship was, then I would have known that these signs of manipulation and coercion and secrecy and isolation, not wanting to meet my friends, these little sloped, these sloped behaviors, they said if I would have known that. So this is based off of the research that we've had and also 25 years of experience. We've deployed our curriculum in the schools for three years now. We've handed out 500 youth surveys after our program. And the points that are in our uh, curriculum are the points that youth said they needed to know or that they, and that they didn't know before. For example, one of the most popular things is, I thought I had to get kidnapped. I had no idea somebody would become my friend. What's the number one way to get into human trafficking? Relationships, right? So the number one way that kids are approached on this was, wasn't even on the radar for them. They were self-protecting against kidnapping or keeping their eyes and ears open uh, for it. So. Fastest growing crimes, what are those crimes? Sextortion is the fastest growing cyber crime right now against young people. Sextortion is connected to sexting and child pornography. Sexting and sextortion of a minor under the age of 18 is felony child pornography because it's sexually explicit photos or videos of a person under the age of 18. And we'll talk a little bit about sex torsion so you know what that is and what our kids are learning. And then sex trafficking uh, is the other fastest growing crime targeting young people. Six keys. So I, I read, I don't like this, but I've read many times that you got to have keys. You got to have a number and then people pay better attention. We want, we want three steps to greatness and six keys. So I'm going to give you six keys. Uh, I had everything written, and I said, I need a title. And I said, I said, we love steps. So this is what we'll call it. Number one, it stays current. We have to stay on top of it. We have to be educated ourselves so that we know what are the trends, what is happening, so that our curriculum is addressing what is going on in their life. Not just what we think is going on or what we learned five years ago, but really educating ourselves to stay on top of what is happening to our youth. The two top things right now is the, the nude photo sharing and sex trafficking. So our curriculum, and you know, if you're gonna make your own or have chats and talks and you know, whatever you know, realm or profession or wherever you're at, stay current, learn about sex torsion, learn about sex trafficking. Uh, number two, inclusive to all scenarios and all youth. So I'll show you a couple of slides in a little bit that we show the young people in our curriculum and in our presentation to show you um, exactly what we mean by this. But it needs to be inclusive to everybody. What we were talking about today, Vicki and Jerome both mentioned this. First of all, it's not just girls. 
So what if you're the young man in the room that is a victim of sex trafficking and you haven't come forward yet and all you're hearing and all you're learning is that this is a girl issue, right? Inclusive to all scenarios. It's in the inner city. It's in the suburbs. It's in our rural areas. In Carver County, it's in our rural areas, okay? It has to be inclusive to every scenario. Traffickers aren't just boyfriends. Jerome had a slide on the different trafficker relationships. It's not just the boyfriend. So if you're a, if you're, let's say you're a young man and the trafficking is happening within your family, you don't fit into the 16 year old girl with the pimp boyfriend scenario. And so how can I identify with that? Is there space for me to come forward? Are people going to believe me if I come forward? Because apparently this just happens to girls at the hands of older boyfriends. So it has to be inclusive to everybody. Uh, being out at a suburban school one time, there was a variety of us uh, speakers. And one of the speakers um, who does incredible, incredible work was highlighting um, how uh, the traffic girls in the inner city. And um, all the emphasis was on trafficked girls in the inner city. And we're out in the suburban school. And I'm kind of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of getting a little, what's a good word, Terry? I'm just getting fidgety. That sounds friendly. So I'm just getting kind of, kind of fidgety because I'm thinking the disconnect from our kids sitting in the bedroom in Minnetonka, in Cologne, with their cell phones, on social media, on Kick and Tinder and Live.me. And I'm thinking, well, they're thinking this don't happen to me, but this is a great lesson, you know, and the disconnect. And so when it was my turn, I said, how many students in this room either have been or know somebody that has been a victim of a sex crime? Every student raised their hand out in the suburbs. Uh, recently, another suburban uh, school, you know, and on the border of rule, um, speaking to 12-year-old 12, 12 sixth graders, there was um, a, a parent in the room and knew that I was going to, I'm with 12-year-olds now, right? And there's a parent in the room. And um, I throw up a slide that has the word sex torsion on it. And I saw, you know, a little pale green, you know, <laughs> a little pale green. I'm good at picking up on cues, usually. So before I present this horrendous information to these 12-year-olds, I say, how many in here know what sexting or sex torsion is? Every student raised their hand. Well, they were 12 to 13. Every student raised their hand. And I said, who in here knows somebody? Because we weren't going to call them out, right? We're going to have a little degree of separation so we could be a little more honest. How many in here know somebody that has participated in sexting or sex torsion, sharing a nude photo with somebody, and now they really, really regret it, and there's some negative consequences going on in their life? A third of these brave 12-year-olds raised their hand. Pale green went away, notebook came out in the pencil, like, you know, because we're talking 12 to 13 year olds already know about this. So it's every age, it's every area, suburban, inner city. We don't want our kids to feel disconnected from the issue because nobody is exempt from this. Although there are higher rates in certain places or with certain vulnerabilities or certain geographical areas, so like if this many youth are sex trafficked, we find about this many have some common vulnerabilities, but what about the this many that we need to get to and that we need to address? So it should be inclusive to all scenarios in youth. Number three, lean into relationships, not statistics. We need to teach our kids, if I say to you a statistic, so I say to Dave Weigel, I say, I really need you to be careful because 12,000 young people are sex trafficked in Minnesota every year. Wow, that's horrendous. And I'm not one of those 12,000, you know, and that sounds like horrible information, right? But if I help Dave understand the behaviors 
of what the grooming and the recruiting and the relationship looks like. A young person out in the community that is uh, being approached by somebody for a crime or for this grooming behavior, right? They're not thinking, oh, who is this person trying to friend me on Facebook because 12,000 people are trafficked in Minnesota, right? But if we lean into those behaviors that are the grooming behaviors, the trafficking behaviors, the predator behaviors, what does it look like to be solicited? What does it look like to be groomed? You know, the gifts, the gift giving, the affection, the um, uh, filling, filling the needs. And so prevention education is going to lean into the relationships or the behavior of predator behaviors, not the statistics. Does that make sense? If you just hear a number, that's not me. I'm, I'm not connected to that. But suddenly there's a person that starts behaving or acting in a certain way about something I learned about, red flag. There's no red flag with a statistic, red flag with behavior identification, right? Uh, number four, prevention is found in two things. If I got rid of everything that I said today, there's two things that are important in prevention education. Number one is the awareness. You know, the, the prevention education, the awareness, the talking points, helping kids understand what this looks like, what's going on, how to get help. So education is one. The most important thing is personal value. Personal value. Parents say to me, I can put on all the controls in the world, I can turn the Wi-Fi off at 10 o'clock at night, I can do everything, every tool, every filter, everything you've told me to do. I've deployed every tactic there possibly is to keep my kids safe. And they still get around the rules. The kind of kid that doesn't want to get around the rules is a kid that has a strong idea of their self-value, their self-worth. They will make the rules before you even have a chance to talk to them about the rules because they have a recognition of their value and of their worth. We need to start speaking life and value and in, in your worth it and purpose and discovery of their gifts and their talents and that they're here for a reason. Those are the kids that are confident kids. Those are the kids easier to say no, quicker to say no. Those are the kids that aren't trying to skirt around the rules, recognition of their value. And with our, pro, we'll talk about our program in a little bit, but it helps discover and bring out in kids their gifts, their talents, their contributions, and really have them for the first time feel, con a lot of them for the first time, not all of them, connected to something bigger than themselves, and for the first time discovering uh, things they haven't even thought about before. But speaking life and value to our young people, that is the biggest prevention tool we could possibly do. Number five, Describes the, now this sounds kind of, you know, describe the law, reporting, and procedure. Youth really want to know that. Uh, in the survey, number one thing that came out was they want to know the law. I mean, why do you think they want to know the law? Why is that so incredibly important? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sometimes, yeah. If I come forward, it's easy to tell a kid, tell. If something bad happens, tell. What's the first thing? What happens if I tell? <laughs> I, mean, I know you're telling me to tell, but what happens if I tell? So I want to know, what is the law? What's that going to look like? You throwing me on a witness stand next week? Because it ain't going to happen. You're going to ask me to confront this person tomorrow? Ain't going to happen. So they want to know, what happens if I tell? So what is the law? Now, fortunately, we live in a state in Minnesota, so if you're working here in Minnesota or at church in Minnesota, um, Minnesota has a really good law. We lead the nation. Actually, we were the fifth state in the nation to actually have a human trafficking or sex trafficking law. Um, and I think there's only 33 states so far that have it. So, and we were the fifth to actually have a law that could protect young people. Uh, and we were the first state in the nation to actually allocate money from Congress to support the law we wrote and said we'd do, which is that 
any person under the age of 18 is not a criminal, will not be criminalized, will not be adjudicated delinquent, will not be treated as a delinquent or a criminal in this tr human trafficking ordeal. They are considered a victim, a survivor, and where there's services available for them as such. You were not, we're not looking at prosecution for somebody. We are looking for resources and how we all work together to support this individual. So we happen to be in a really great state when it comes uh, to the law and to the legal process. Now, the one thing about understanding legal process, right, and working together as a community is it's really hard to work together if we don't have relationship. So it kind of puts an onus on us and it puts a little responsibility on us to get to know those people in our community that are going to be helpful, that are resources, that are going to work with me, right? Law enforcement. Know your local law enforcement. Know the person in charge of human trafficking investigations for your particular area because that is going to be a fabulous call and a fabulous relationship you're going to want to have. If you're not confident, they're not confident. Well, let's call the cops and see what happens, but I'm not sure. You know, toss a coin. No, I know somebody in law enforcement that's been doing human trafficking investigations for 10 years. I got his number. I got her number. We can give them a call. Right? So having those organizations that can work as advocates. Um, so it puts a little responsibility on us to know who these people are and to build relationships so we are confident we have those relationships that we can call upon when we find ourselves needing to provide some support services, whether in intervention or restoration. Um, and number six, it has to have a strong message of hope and encouragement. Um, every time I'm speaking in a class or an assembly and I'm f in front of young people and I'm in front of teenagers, I just picture myself skipping like, you know, through flowers and lilies and rainbows and unicorns are everywhere because I just love young people. And I'm thinking, these, these are, this is the army right here. This, these are the people right here. This is the voice of this generation. These are the ones that need to know. Because I'm not going to be there on Friday night at the party when something's going south, but they're going to be the ones at the party when something's going south. I'm not going to be there at school when somebody's getting bullied or picked on. You know, I'm going to be doing something I don't want to do because I want to be in school. But they're the ones that are going to be there. They can pick up on the cues. They're going to be the voice. They're the front lines because they're the ones that are being targeted. So it is a message of hope and encouragement. Not that here's the dark world that is happening. It's that you are the light in the situation. You're the new voice to this generation. You're the one that's going to make a difference. And our the steps of our program help, help discover that a little bit more. But um, See, I start getting excited when I, when I even just think, I'm picturing myself at the assembly on stage, and there's teens everywhere. And, you know, you can, you can just see that it, I don't have to do the dark world thing. I can understand the reality, but I can do the solution thing, right? When we're giving them that hope and encouragement. And know this, that every time you are speaking to young people into a group or to a class, there is somebody there already impacted. There's somebody there already affected. When we know that up to one in five girls has already experienced a sexual assault or abuse, when we know that one in six boys have experienced a sexually abusive experience uh, before the uh, age of 18, right? We know that we are speaking to somebody already affected in that room. So we need to have that hope, that hope, that confidence in coming forward. Talk about who are, I love asking young people, who are trusted adults in your life? They have so many different answers. For some, it's grandma. For some, it's dad. For some, it's my teacher. For some, it's my coach. But helping them remember, you know, who are the trusted people and be confident in the process, what's going to happen if they do come forward to tell. Um, so hope and encouragement that they are the solution and the answer. So watching my clock, I'm just going to give you a little bit because when, every time I ask uh, kids, no matter what age, do you know what sexting or sextortion is? They do. 
When I ask adults, I was even at the uh, Minnesota National Guard for a training, and I've been at many adult settings. Who knows what sex torsion is? And I've got zero to half, usually. <laughs> um, so sexting we know is sending inappropriate or nude or sexual photos of ourself to somebody else over an electronic device, right? Nude photo sharing or sexual photo sharing. Sextortion is that online exploitation where coercion, blackmail, force, threats to send me those sexually explicit photos and videos is happening to our young people. Um, and the rates are 50% of victims of this identify as female, 50% identify as male. So this isn't a girl issue. This isn't a female student issue. Uh, Young men, 50% are affected by this. You know, how is that? Send me a photo. Everybody's doing it. Okay, you know, send the photo because maybe you'll like me more. Maybe you'll love me. Maybe you'll date me. Maybe you won't uh, break up with me because apparently everybody's doing it, so I better do it too. And then you send that first photo, and then it becomes send me more or else. Sex torsion. Um, and a whole room full of 12-year-olds knows about it. It's a criminal felony child pornography, by the way, and yes, young people can be convicted of that, but the flip side of that is somebody that sent a photo with no intention of it going everywhere. Each case is looked at individually from a criminal perspective, but if you sent that photo to the boyfriend or the girlfriend and they decided because you broke up or they didn't like you today or they thought it was cool, they had a nude photo and they showed everybody, um, they, can be, they can be charged the flip side of that is young people that come forward when that's happening to them, there is this law designed to protect them, to put a stop to it, and the threat that if you send me more or else, the or else has already happened every single time. I don't know of a time when the or else hadn't already happened. It's already sent. It's already shared. It's already been shown to people you don't want to have see it. So that's what we're dealing with in sextortion. So those are the friends and the peers and the people we know. It also happens with fake online profiles. I keep telling young people, if you don't know them in real life, you don't know them at all because they're picking a photo. Google, hot 19-year-old chick, boom, profile photo, right? Now hot 19-year-old chick starts friending on Facebook a whole bunch of high school boys, right? Start sending photos because I'm Googling hot chick photo with topless. Send it to this unsuspecting young man. Here's me. Show me you, right? Well, largest child pornography case in Minnesota history. That's exactly what happened. And 171 high school boys sent their nude photos to what they thought was a 19-year-old uh, young woman. And it was pretty exciting because he picked a really good uh, picture, and apparently she travels a lot too, and it was pretty exciting and found out that it was actually a, I think it was 33, 33-year-old 33 man in Egan, Minnesota at his home computer pretending to be a 19-year-old girl, and a thousand images were distributed into the dark web of high school boys. So that's sextortion, that's what they're dealing with. Sex trafficking we learned about today. We learned the definition. Uh, trafficked youth, it's in every county. The age range is from infants to young adults when we're talking about youth. Um, I've had the unfortunate of having some infant uh, cases myself. So here's the photo that we show the kids. In order for sex trafficking to happen, we need to have a trafficker. Right? We need to have somebody that is doing this for profit and making the money, make, making the profit off of the young person. We have to have the young person. Who's missing that we hardly ever talk about? We got the seller, this is economics, we got the seller, we got the product. The buyer, the buyer right? Hardly ever talked about. Sex trafficking don't happen here. Oh, okay, well. We did a sting operation during the Ryder Cup, and nine men from our area were arrested showing up to buy sex with a 15-year-old. So we also got to think about buyers when we think about our communities, and how do we end human trafficking? We, we, we get ahead of the victims in prevention education, right? We get ahead of traffickers and buyers in how do we design our children and our youth ministries, engagement, schools, how do we impact young people's lives in the beginning so I don't become that 50-year-old buyer uh, 30 years from now? 
and pornography plays a huge role in that. So there's prevention for all three, um, just to plug that because it's super important. Um, so we have to have a buyer, we have to have the trafficker, and we have to have the young person. Just putting in your mind who's who when you look at these photos, and I ask the kids to you know do the same thing, but I also let them know there's no pop quiz, otherwise they duck under the chair. Um, so looking at these who's who, and the answer is all four of these are convicted sex traffickers in the state of Minnesota. All four of them. So when we're talking about we need to have inclusive prevention education, what if it's your friend? What if it's not the 30-year-old charming boyfriend? Up here, what if it's grandma? And what if it's this guy that looks pretty safe? And then what if it is the boyfriend? What if it's our friend at school? And our friend at school is making friends with a marginalized student that eats lunch alone and picks up on that, and I bet you she needs a friend, and makes friends with a marginalized student at school that had some developmental disabilities, didn't have a lot of friends, becomes her friend, becomes her best friend, starts inviting her out after school to hang out. She's thinking this is the best thing in the world. And then within weeks is now selling this student uh, for profit after school. And she's not a well-connected student, and she's feeling like this is the first person that has ever paid attention to me. That's kind of the trauma bond and some of those reasons that secrecy happens as well. So it can be, what's the point? Male or female, late teens to adults, peers, gangs, occults, and family members. Our legal response I talked about, know that Minnesota is great. We kind of got to educate ourselves a little bit if we're going to help educate our young people and build their confidence. We're in a really great state when it comes to the law. So prevention education. This is our curriculum uh, uh, that we developed at Act United. This curriculum is called Youth Aware. It's a teen sexual exploitation prevention program. Um, of course I love it because, you know, we developed it, but I really love it because it does three different things. We have three steps. Now schools, churches, youth organizations can take us up on all three or they can just do the first one. Totally fine. But the first step is the awareness presentation. And we can do it in the classroom. Sometimes we do it in health class. Sometimes we're there for like four classes in a row to hit all the students coming through health class. And sometimes we do a large group assembly. This is where they get the, this, we call this step educate. This is where they get the awareness information they need on those behaviors and those things that are the signs and the indicators that are preparing them for abuse or exploitation. And importantly, we talk about uh, healthy relationships. So a lot of the points also meet our national education standards for healthy relationships and for our uh, internet safety. Um, especially when schools are trying to get grants um, to upgrade their technology, you have to meet certain criteria of training for your students, and ours also meets that. Um, so we teach them the signs and indicators, internet safety, healthy relationships, and then we have a peer survivor video. So they get to hear from somebody their age who ended up in sex trafficking, and, um, and then importantly, how they got out, and how they got out was from another friend, another person their age, like I'm talking about, where they're the ones in the day to day. So before the parents noticed, before anybody else noticed, her friend noticed, and he became the one to step in and saved her life. Um, and then we talk about the law, because remember, that's the number one question students have. Uh, resources, support, and then importantly, how youth are leading in ending human trafficking in our generation. To connect them to those things, those possibilities that uh, make them the voice and the action step for what we do. Now, if schools want to, our step two is our youth aware student group. So we'll come into the school or the church or the organization and we will lead a small group for three to four weeks, whatever the schedule allows. We will do it, we will partner with um, a, a counselor, social worker, teacher from the school or the youth pastor at the church and we'll run small groups for four weeks which is where students get an opportunity to go deeper on the topics. We discuss, we talk, we chat, They have que and they have questions about healthy relationships, about what to do if I suspect a friend is in trouble Tell me more about the law. We get that a lot. We get those everyday questions like, well, what about, what about stripping? 
What about dancing? What if they just want to take photos of the young person? And because this is, if they're asking me, they've been asked, right? So we get an opportunity in a smaller group setting to ask questions, to be less intimidated, because you're not going to raise your hand at the 400 student assembly, right? But you're going to do it in our small group. We have been able to interdict on sex trafficking cases and occurrences as a part of small group. We find that sometimes students opt into this group because they already have this issue with themselves or somebody they know. They're coming to get the answers that they need to build the confidence they want to have before they tell somebody. And so it's, it's really being the speaker, being the presenter with the information is incredible. It's the first step, but it's really in that uh, small group where they start to engage and we get to uh, interdict and see some really cool stuff happen. And then out of that group, step three is a student-led awareness project. So they take what they learned, what they know, and they design and they lead and execute a student-led awareness project for their school or for their church or even in their community. Um, this is a project done by Patrick Henry High School in North Minneapolis. And they, they said, we have way too much of this in our school. So we're going to set up a booth. We're going to do um, this banner. We're going to pick images that we know, the people that we know need to see. We're going to get them to the table. And these 10 students were able to spread information and make contact with hundreds of other students by setting up a booth in the lunchroom. So for five lunch periods, we got to make contact with hundreds of other students. And watching them go from, what could I possibly do, who am I, to talking to these students like they'd been teaching this information and they conduct training seminars, you know, nationwide. They're like, that's not the truth. The truth is this, and you need to watch out for this. And watching them take what they literally just learned and then become the advocates of information and empowerment to other students, it was just incredible. Uh, we're back with them for a second year in a row. Um, and this was birthed out of, that's Anna, this was birthed out of Minnetonka High School. And Anna said, um, people don't realize that this is happening out here right in our community. So we need to do an awareness project in the community. And she said, I'm in band and I'm in orchestra. That's my skill. So she got together other uh, uh, youth bands and orchestra and from Gustavus Adolphus, a, a choir and band. And we had a rock the barn night out in uh, the border of Chaska and Cologne at the Outpost Center. And we had a youth benefit concert. We raised money for Youth Aware so we could get into two more schools. These students took the lead on the whole project, became the advocates for this. We had 120 people show up from the community to learn about human trafficking out here and be connected to resources. And they led and they did the whole thing. And now Anna is at uh, Maryland. Yep. And she decided to be in a, uh, in a, in a dorm dedicated to being, um, she took all of this, went off to Maryland, went off to school, and chose a dorm. I can't think of the name right now, but it's uh, activist, an activist dorm for uh, those that are engaged in social justice issues so that she can take what she learned in this educational program to Maryland and on her campus. So now we have Anna out in Maryland doing it, and she's uh, coming back in June to volunteer with us over the summer. So they're the voice, right? Prevention education in one school turns into a, a whole bunch of youth learning more, discovering their connection and their contribution to 120 people in the community, to her in Maryland bringing prevention education on campus. How many of you know sexual assault and trafficking and sex crimes on campus is kind of a big deal? And so we have, uh, we have Anna out there. We also have programs for kids. Um, if you want to learn more, meet us at the table. Um, and I'm going to hashtag it too. <laughs> The kids are telling me, you better start hashtagging and do videos. We don't read information anymore, honey. We want to see it on video. So I'm trying. I'm trying, young people. I'm catching up. So hashtag United We Win. We're on social media. We're on Instagram. We're on Facebook, Act United. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel. These sessions will be available up there in two weeks. We also have previous sessions that are already up to learn more about sextortion. Uh, fabulous thing to know if you know a 
if you know one child, sex torsion would be a fabulous session to look at. So this is how I'm going to end. I'm going to bring up a couple of people that have tables out in the sunroom, and I want to introduce you to some small steps that make a huge impact when it comes to making a difference. If you're kind of tired of this happening and you're kind of tired of just saying, here's more information, we need to get ahead of this, we need to end this, we need to do something, these are the steps that you can take. So I want to ask Scott Morin to come up first. Uh, him and his wife are the co-directors and founders of Empowering Ranch in Minnesota. So uh, Scott will talk about a little bit about his story and what brings him into the start of Empowering Ranch and the different services that they provide. You're going to want to pay attention because part of this journey is restoration. It's when we do know somebody and this has happened, what are some of those avenues, those mentorings, those programs, those opportunities where people can come forward and find a place of hope and healing in a non-judgmental way? And Scott's uh, Empowering Ranch does exactly that. So take this resource back with you uh, after listening to Scott. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. Hello, everyone. Uh, wow, phenomenal stuff. Thanks, Jessica. Thanks, Jerome. Thank you to you as well for sharing. Uh, I found myself impacted all over again by the issue. Found myself in tears at times of what happened to all of us. And <clears throat> I'm one of those people. Um, I'm here to be a a male voice uh, to for men and boys to just break the silence. And what I experienced was incest as a kid. And I was around seven or eight years old, and that messed me up, to say the least. And uh, interestingly enough, I got introduced to pornography around the same time. And uh, a little bit of an entertaining story, a guardian came to me, third event, all within the same year, and talked to me about masturbation, and they did such a poor job that I thought for the next five years, every time I itched myself, I was masturbating. And so, like, I tell these stories because we have to get the shame off of talking about these issues. Like, we need to be able to name the words, say the things, say the things that happen to actually be able to talk about this stuff. You know, one of the, if there's something that I could humbly recommend to everyone in the room that you can start today is constantly start talking about sexuality with every boy that you know. Um, the 11 to 13 year old brain, boy brain kicks out two to four times more dopamine than an adult brain. And so if you can keep that kid off of pornography between the ages of 11 and 13, there's a much better chance that they're not going to get addicted to porn. And as you've heard our presenters say, this whole industry is built on porn. And so anyways, uh, from, from there, my life went into decades of sexual addiction before I finally was able to find some help in my early 30s and get into recovery. And uh, something that helped me was being around others who used to struggle who weren't anymore. That was one of the big things, changing my belief system. Most men and boys think that sex is a need versus a want. It's a God-given want. It's a beautiful thing. It's beautiful in the right context, but it's not technically a need. Men and boys aren't going to die if they never have another orgasm. If they don't eat, yes, they'll die. But if they if they don't have an orgasm, if they never have a sexual encounter in their life, they're not going to die. And when I changed my belief system, behaviors start to line up with beliefs when you change belief systems. So that's part of what needs to be addressed. But with, um, with boys, I mean, it's got to be almost weekly conversations. It, it create a culture in your homes, parents, grandparents, friends, whoever's in this room. You've got to create a culture where it's at ease to talk about sexuality. Um, I'll tell you one story about my wife. She uh, grew up in that kind of a culture, kind of ironic. We grew up in very opposite cultures. She grew up in a culture where she could talk about that anytime. So at 19 years old, she's in college with her girlfriends talking about how long sex lasts and none of them know. So they call at one in the morning, her parents, and wake them up. 
And uh, her, her mom answers the phone and she's like, hey mom, how long does sex last? She, she starts bursts into laughter and says, hold on a second, I gotta get your dad on the phone. Gets him on the phone and they're like, hey, we wanna know your guesses first. So they go through this process of what, what do you, how long do you think it lasts, you know, and they're laughing and, you know, one is like five minutes, one is like an hour, the other one's like all night long, you know. And, um, and, and after the question was answered, she's like, thanks, bye. And my wife doesn't have the sexual baggage that I came into our marriage with. And I think part of the reason why is because she grew up in a family and a culture that was willing to talk about it anytime, anywhere, no shame. And so that's one of the things that can be done. Anyways, I uh, got into my own recovery journey and uh, my wife and I have our own business organization. You may have gotten uh, this flyer when you checked in and uh, you're, you're not going to see a whole lot on this flyer about sexuality, but what I do on these wilderness weekends, one of them is a father-son initiation weekend, and the other two are just men's weekends, but what the first thing I do is, sh is share my story of sexual brokenness. And what that leads to is an environment where men th then feel the freedom to do the same. And, uh, you know, I shared my story once in a room of 16 men, uh, my story of incest, and eight out of those 16 men confess confessed that they had some sort of a sexual experience in their childhood as well. So it's, uh, it's rampant. So anyways, that's one resource. And then, of course, I do counseling around uh, helping folks with their sexual journey get to a, a healthy place. So um, my table's out here, got a business card on the table. But bless you all, and thank you, everyone, for coming to help address this issue for uh, boys and men and also for women and girls. Thank you, Jessica, for putting this together. So I'm going to have Dave and Susie Weigel come up uh, with the organization Running for Justice. They're also out there. Uh, they help raise awareness and funds to fight sex trafficking both here and globally. They're also one of our conference sponsors every year. And they're going to talk about some fun community ways to get engaged. So, um, and we're there every, we're there every year. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you to your speakers and Jessica. Um, yeah, we started Renamed for Justice about eight years ago. Eight years ago. And um, I was molested as a child one time, but it wrecked my life, you know, to a degree. And uh, it was a family adult member. And uh, I didn't really know that I was going to do anything with that. And I, hi, we have six children. I couldn't have kids, and God healed me. We have six. Uh, they're 28 to 38 right now. And so anyways, I protected our daughters. You know, didn't realize then that boys were at high risk. Didn't know, and didn't even know that, I didn't know anything about sex trafficking then. Just knew they could be molested or raped or whatever. So I highly protected them. It was high on my list of priorities, and they were molested, both of them. That about killed me. That was tough. I was like, where was I? You know. So going through that process. But anyways, we have a daughter that's been involved, and she went overseas. Uh, when she was 17, she turned 18 while she was there working for YWAM. And that was right after the tsunami, and she went over there to go into bars and work with prostitutes. And I thought, that's great. I'm really proud of you. And I still had no idea I would get involved in this. And then we met Dan Notley, who was how I, Dan and Trish Notley, I found out about Jessica. That's how I met her through them. And um, they did stuff over in Thailand. And so I thought, I'm going to get involved with them to help raise funds. So we started the, uh, we have a 5K in August. This will be our seventh one, August 17th. And I don't have the flyers for it yet. So, um, so the first two years that we had the 5K, we had the 5K, and then we always have a speaker afterwards. Jessica spoke at it last year. She spoke at our bike last year. And... Um, 
I'm sorry, I'm blank. <laughs> so anyways, um, we started this 5K and... And gave to uh, Thailand. Oh, right, gave to Dan and Trish Notley. And, uh, and then I just started getting kind of irritated, like, what is going on here? And here, God was just, if I start something, sometimes unless he changes it, I don't want to step out of what I'm doing, you know. Like Dave said, if the horse is dead, get off. And that's, that's hard for a person like me. Yeah. So anyways, um, so it was just God stirring in my heart so that I would, uh, I really could see as I went out to bring flyers out, we bring about six to 800 flyers out for our 5K to different communities and distribute stuff on what sex trafficking is. And I was just like, I want to do more around here. So even though we still give funds to them, we give to different organizations, and it, it's not usually having to do with the organizations that are just only like uh, rescuing victims or whatever, but it's prevention. That's our thing, is preventing sex trafficking through education and awareness into our communities and beyond. And so um, we have these events, and we started the bike This will be our third annual one. We did from Duluth Elk River. Uh, it was a two-day thing, and um, I just wasn't happy with the end part where we have a speaker come in and have a meal. I didn't think there was community involvement, so we changed it this year to be out of Big Lake, if anybody knows where that is. And we're doing four different routes. So... Um, we do this to bring education, awareness, and to bring these funds to different organizations that need it. So, we'll see. And my husband's a big part of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the divine irritation that was in Susie's heart was that we think of this as a, a problem that happens overseas, and we're just becoming more and more aware that, no, this is at home. And so the divine irritation that caused her to get off the dead horse was really that uh, we need um, education and awareness in our churches, in our communities, in our, in our neighborhoods, uh, getting involved with different um, uh, organizations within our city, a homeless organization, for instance, that um, they, they espouse many different ideals that we don't espouse, but yet we have a common thread uh, that we want to get on board with and, and work. So. Um, you know, what I love about what you're doing here, Jessica, uh, and what I have, uh, again, been a little bit um, uh, stirred in my heart, uh, as a pastor, um, we get people come in that want help. They want alms. They, they need some money. And over the years, I've, I've run across as I'm sitting here thinking, if I would have known then what I know now, I could probably have identified some gals that were either just stepped, we're working with one right now, that the suspicions are pretty strong, that she's just stepping, trying to step away from some relationships that I know were abusive, whether they were sex trafficking or not, I don't know. Um, but some of the, another gal came in with her boyfriend, and she was pretty open about being a dancer. She was in there because she was having uh, voices speak to her, and she was having all sorts of crazy things happening, so she wanted to get with somebody that supposedly knew how to take care of that stuff. And and while I went after that stuff, I was very aware that uh, she was probably a gal that was involved with some kind of trafficking. And uh, so bringing up this kind of awareness, I want to find a language. You helped. Um, I need to get in touch with this regional navigator and uh, just find out what are the things, how can I more wisely as a pastor when I have interaction with people? And that's not just for me as a pastor. This is really for all of us. Yeah. That, that just happens to be where I can uh, apply it. But I'm sorry, we're, we're going over our time. Um, but we really uh, do appreciate everything that Jessica does and for all of you being here. Thank you. Yeah. They're so humble and friendly and nice. But when you show up to that 5K and that bike-a-thon, we are having a blast. It is community together. And it's like, what are those small steps I can do? If you can ride a bike, you can, you know, 
You can come be a part of community. You can, you know, join us to come together and ride a bike to raise funds for rescue homes in Thailand, to raise uh, funds for awareness and rest restoration homes. I know that was a recent uh, uh, benefactor of that uh, of these events. And if you can walk and you can run, uh, my nine-year-old did the 5K last year. And you know, probably a half run, quarter jog, quarter crawl, and then needed a whole lot of Cheez-Its and water, but she made it. You know, so it's really a family event and super fun and way to engage and meet others too. Um, so those are those things. Like, are you a cop or on a rescue mission or are you going on an overseas thing? No, but I'm a teacher, but I'm a nurse, but I'm a doctor, but I'm a parent and I can ride a bike or I can walk and I can run. So there's so many different ways to be a part of the solution. So the last uh, table representative that I'm gonna bring up here um, and then have one closing comment and I'll dismiss you is would Keith or Terry or both from Trafficking Justice like to come? Did I even warn you guys? <laughs> Keith, Keith goes, I don't know. And he's just, <laughs> and he's looking at Terry like I have to use this one right here. All right, uh, to talk about Freedom Weekend coming up. Yeah, do you have a flyer, Terry? Or, um, I'm really excited. We partner with Act United and Jessica Bartholomew, her team and our team share so many common values. And uh, one of them I want to mention, we, we have an event May 3rd through 5th. There's five, it's a conference, there's five different events ranging from um, Friday night session where it's straight talk to parents from a police officer uh, in Eden Prairie that works in sex trafficking crimes. Also, Jessica is going to be speaking. This is what's happening in our communities and what you can do about it. Uh, Saturday morning, we're going to have a, uh, a former buyer who was arrested in a sting operation share his story. That actually was a positive turning point in his life because prior to that point, uh, he was a sex addict and it culminated with that arrest and the restoration of his life and the seeds that led to that decision to make that purchase were, were formed over many, many years. Um, we're going to have a, a, a woman who was sex trafficked actually out of her church by a youth leader share about what she wants the church to know about sex trafficking. And, um, and then uh, I'm really excited about this youth rally that we're going to have. <laughs> when Jessica was jumping up and down about speaking in front of youth and, yeah, they're the answer. Well, we're having this youth rally. Okay, it's Saturday night, May 4th, at the University of Minnesota the North Star Ballroom uh, on the St. Paul campus. So we're going to have a band, Remedy Drive, who's the leader of that band, does rescue operations in countries around the world. They have a passion for that. Uh, they're going to have a free concert. And then we're going to have uh, some, some teens speak about how they're involved in this cause, some college students speak about why they're involved in that cause. All the all teens in our metro area are invited to come. We especially are inviting uh, youth group leaders to invite their youth group teens to come to this event. And Jessica also is going to share. And you can see her passion about telling teens that you matter, that you have purpose, that you have destiny in your lives, that you can make a difference in your world, that this is happening to you and your peers. And if we can mobilize those teens to be eyes and ears and friends, they see someone being bullied or mistreated or even being abused, they can speak up. We can have teens, instead of just resigning to the fact that, oh, our teens are just going to be on, that, on their phone all day playing video games, and you know, we can challenge them. Teens will rise to the challenge that you give them. So we're so excited about this youth rally. We want to challenge the teens. The theme is music, message, and then mission. So Jessica is going to deliver the mission along with some of the teens that will share their mission. And so I encourage if you know any teen that is wondering why I'm here or maybe they just want to go to a free concert by a cool band, we're also going to have a hip-hop guy 
He's actually a youth pastor that I just found out does hip-hop stuff, and I just actually learned what hip-hop was when I saw <laughs> I had no clue what it was. I'm still not totally sure I know what it is, but... Um, so we're really excited about that. I just want to share that because when you were sharing your passion about, you know, speaking to youth. So uh, check, check out this rally. Invite your friends. Our, our goal, Trafficking Justice, is to, first of all, inspire, second of all, equip, and third of all, mobilize. We want to mobilize individuals, whether you're a person of faith or not, to do something, to say something in six different dimensions of trafficking, whether it be restoration, whether it be just awareness, whether it be prevention, prevention of the most vulnerable, whether it be legal advocacy, uh, d different areas. And so uh, you can stop by our table and find out how you can get involved. We do a lot of things together with Act United and uh, you know, Running for Justice is promoting our events, we're promoting theirs. We found that we want to um, connect with all the different organizations, all the different people. Scott Morin, who was up here earlier today, he's going to speak at our Freedom Weekend event about the effect of sex addiction on families. And so uh, I just encourage you, when you're leaving tonight, just if there's just one thing, or this afternoon, just one thing that you could do, one small thing that you can do, when we all do one small thing, many great things happen. And, and as, as Jessica mentioned earlier, you know, it's, it's not about stats. It's about people. People that we want to protect, people that we want to empower, teens that we don't want to just give rules to, don't do this, don't do that. I love what you said, help kids make their own rules. You know. So um, yeah, I've, I've talked enough, but anyway, that's what we do. Uh, check out our table and uh, we'll talk to you soon. a guy that had no idea he was coming up, right? <laughs> so please take one action step today by visiting a table in there. If you want to learn more about the Youth Aware program, we have the syllabus available. We have the info sheets that you can pass on to the school, the church, or whatever. So visit the Act United table, and you can learn about how to schedule that. Uh, stop by Running for Justice. Get more information about a bike-a-thon, a walk, walk, run, 5K. Uh, Sign up for the Freedom Food Truck. They need help serving food over the summer at different events. You know, what an awesome way. If you're a foodie, hop on the truck. Serve some falafels and make a difference, right? I just eat falafels. I don't, yeah, that's my foodie extent. I love to eat. So please take time to visit, grab a snack, and um, at, from Act United and from all our partners, from all our sponsors, all our volunteers. This, and I'm telling you, this shindig goes down over the course of months with a team of 20 volunteers. So thank you so much, volunteers, for making this happen. And um, thank you so much for being here and connecting as a community on such an important issue, such a public health issue. Uh, we can, united, make a difference. So thank you very much. Amen. Amen.